site planning becomes absolutely critical because you have to balance it between making sure you have enough overlapping coverage to maintain a quality voice call but enough channel separation not to suffer significant co-channel interference and degradate the performance of the call. So now we've talked about overlapping cells, the other thing I want to talk about is between floors. So just like your signals can travel through walls and other obstacles, your signals can actually penetrate through ceilings and floors as well. And this is particularly relevant if you're deploying your access point, like most people do, up very close to the ceiling, you can expect some spillage over to the floor above. And of course, different buildings have different ceiling constructions and different floor constructions. And so that spillover to the floor above or below is going to be unique in each site that you go out and visit. Now, the thing I want to mention here is that spillover to the other floor is not always bad. And you might actually use it to actually provide coverage in the floor above or the floor below. So don't always assume that spillover between floors is bad. It's just something that you have to consider when you're doing your site planning. Now, I put this picture together into this slide for you because there's a problem with this and it illustrates what you have to do when you're doing your site planning. And the issue here is that directly above floor one, floor two, I've deployed the access point on the same channel as I did on floor one. So what this means is that if I have spillover, that spillover is going to be in the same frequency, i.e. they're going to overlap and interfere with each other. So what you want to do when you're deploying your access points on different floors is you need to think about not only what the adjoining channel is for your surrounding access points on the same floor, but also what is the channel that you're using for the access point on the floor below and the floor above. The other thing you should also be aware of is that spillover between adjoining floors not only makes a difference depending on what the composition of the floor and the ceiling is, but it also makes a difference depending on what type of antenna that you're using. And typically, if you're using an Omni antenna, you're going to see more spillover between the floors than, say, for instance, if you're deploying a directional antenna, like a patch antenna, for instance. So we've had a good discussion about understanding the frequencies and the channel bandwidth and the implications to cell planning. Let's go on now and talk a little bit about the radio and how I send your signals over the air. Now, when you think about a radio, a radio really consists of two parts. It has a transmitter and a receiver. And the transmitter is a thing that's going to take your signal and encode it and then it's going to modulate it. And what we mean by modulation is it's going to represent your ones and zeros, your data, into waveforms, because waveforms is what's actually going to go out and over the air. And then on the receiving side, the antenna will receive those waveforms. It'll demodulate the signal, turning it back into ones and zeros, and then decode it and hopefully get back to your user data. Important characteristics of a radio are what frequencies it's operating on. Again, in Wi-Fi, we're talking about 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. The transmitted power level, because the higher the power, the further my signal will go. And the type of modulation that I'm using to represent your ones and zeros in waveforms. So I want to talk about coding first. Here in this illustration, I'm looking at the coding that's done in 802.11a and g. And for backward compatibility, this coding is also supported in 802.11n, as well as some additional coding capabilities. And what coding means is I'm literally adding redundancy to the data stream. So in this illustration, for instance, you see bit zero coming in, and I put it through the coder, and then out of it becomes two bits, bit one and bit zero. So this is what we would call a half-rate coder, 
one informational bit coming in and two bits coming out. So what I'm doing here is I'm sending two bits for your one information bit. And so it's possible that I could lose one of these bits over the air and I'd still be able to get back to your user data. So coding is a way of adding redundancy into the data stream to enable me to recover your data. And this is very important in radio because in radio things happen over the air and I'm always losing bits. And if I had to retransmit the whole packet every time, I wouldn't get anything across the radio link. So you always want to add some redundancy in radio. Now, however, if I'm in really good RF conditions, I don't need to add as much redundancy. So if I'm close to the access point, really got a very good strong signal, then maybe I can use a 5-6 coder, which means 5 information bits in, 6 bits out. If I'm out on the edge of the cell, having much more difficulty recovering my signal, getting a lot of errors, then I want to use a half-rate coder, 1 bit in, 2 bits out uh, over the air. Now the thing to notice here is this obviously affects your use of data rate. So if I'm sending more redundant bits, your actual use of data rate is lower. So as I change the coding, as you move around in the cell, I'm going to change the data rate. On the edge of the cell, where I have to use more redundancy, your data rates are going to be lower than if you're closer to the access point in better RF conditions where I can use a lower rate coder. OK, let's talk about modulation. Now, what goes over the air is waveforms, sine waves, as illustrated in this picture. And so we need to take your ones and zeros and represent them in waveforms. And there's different ways of doing this. You can do pulse modulation, amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, phase modulation. And in this illustration, I'm actually illustrating phase modulation. And this is what we want to use in Wi-Fi and it's also used in the cellular networks as well because it's a little bit more robust than some of the other techniques. Now to understand phase modulation, imagine if you were holding the other end of a rope and I'm holding one end and I start the waveform by throwing my hand up in the air and I say that's a zero. And then I start the waveform by pushing my hand down and I say that's a one. If you can detect that on your hand holding the other end of the rope, then you can distinguish between my ones and zeros and you can recover my signal. And that's what phase modulation, you can see here, the first one, the waveform starts by going up and the second one starts by going down. And that's what we call a 180 degree phase shift, simply by doing that, at the receiving side, you can detect and say, okay, that's a zero and that's a one. And that's what we mean by phase shift keying. Now, the term binary phase shift keying is in this picture, I'm using one waveform to represent one bit. So binary phase shift keying. So one bit per waveform or what we should, in correct terminology, say one bit per modulation symbol. Now in this illustration, I'm actually now sending two bits per waveform. And so rather than altering the phase by 180 degrees, I'm now altering the phase by 90 degrees. And so you can see that I've got four different waveforms here. Now, if I have four different waveforms, what that allows me to do is to send two bits per waveform. So you can see the first waveform starts by going up and I say that's a zero one. The next waveform starts by coming down. So it's a 90 degree phase shift and that waveform represents one one. And then in the next modulation symbol here, you can see I'm starting it by going down and that's representing one zero. And the next one, I'm starting it by going up and that represents zero zero. And as long as your receiver can detect those differences in the phases, then it can recover the signal. Now, what have I done here? What I've done is I've doubled your data rate in the same frequency channel. So without increasing the bandwidth, I've doubled your data rate simply by going to a higher order phase modulation. 
Now this is referred to as quadrature phase shift keying. So you can say, Ava, why don't you keep going and go to 8 PSK, 16 PSK, keep going, and I can represent more bits per waveform. And that's true, and I can. In radio, however, I always want to optimize it. And it's actually more efficient if I go to a combination of phase and amplitude modulation, where I'm not only altering the phase of the wave, but I'm also altering the amplitude of the wave, that is the height of the wave, or you can consider like the power that I'm introducing into the wave. So I can say if I send you a really big wave, that represents a 1. If I send you a little wave, that represents a 0. And so by distinguishing between the amplitudes, you can distinguish between my 1s and zeros. And so quadrature amplitude modulation is where I combine the phase modulation and the amplitude modulation. And so what you see here over the left is something called 16 QAM, 16 quadrature amplitude modulation. And you can see I have 16 points. And each one of these points represents a unique phase and amplitude. So the phase is represented as I turn around in a circular fashion around this polar plot. And the amplitude is represented from the distance from the origin out to the point. And so again, each one of these has a unique phase and amplitude. Now if I have 16 points, that's 2 to the power 4, which means that each one of these points can represent 4 unique bits. So one of these bits can represent 0, 0, 0, 0, and another one of these points will represent 0, 1, 0, 0. And so I'm now able to send four bits per waveform, four bits per modulation symbol. So I have doubled your data rate again in the same spectrum. And then I can keep going. I can go to 64 QAM. And now you see I have 64 bits, which is 2 to the power 6. So now I can represent 6 bits per modulation symbol, 6 bits per waveform. You can say to me, why don't I keep going? Well, there's a problem here. You'll notice that these points are getting closer and closer together, which means that the differentiation between the phase and the amplitude is getting smaller and smaller. So if I'm in a difficult RF environment and that signal is bouncing off walls and propagating through walls, the ability for me to recover the signal and detect the differences between those phases and the amplitude will start to reduce. So what happens is that if I'm in good RF conditions, close to the axis point, then I can use 64 QAM and send 6 bits per modulation symbol. But as I move out to the edge of the cell and I move into more difficult RF environments, I have to start downgrading my modulation rate 16 QAM to QPSK and out on the edge of the cell down to BPSK, the binary phase shift key. So what's going to happen as I move around in my cell, I'll change the modulation and that's going to reduce down my data rate because I'm sending less bits per waveform. So just like we went in with the coding example, both modulation and coding, if I'm in good RF conditions, I can send more bits and in more difficult out of environment, I'm sending less bits, so my data rate will be reduced. So now you understand why when I move around in my cell, my data rates will vary. And you've all seen this when you connect to your wireless network. You'll see it will say strength excellent, not so good, weak. What I'm doing there is I'm basically changing your modulation and coding, and that's impacting your data rate. Now, to help you understand this from a deployment perspective, one of the things you're going to need to do on your site survey is you may need to set up the access point to operate on different data rates. So, for instance, let's say in your site survey, you discover that the customer is deploying